The teaching text tonight is from Song of Songs, um, 3 verses 1 through 4. All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city, through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good evening. My name is Susie. I'm the pastor of Equipping and Ministry. If it's your first time here, welcome. You've joined us in the beginning of, well, in the, about three weeks into the beginning of a series that we're doing all summer called Teach Us to Pray, in which we're talking about what does it look like to pray individually and as a community. This first month, um, we focused on upward prayer, a prayer that was focused on God and not ourselves or not other people or maybe the things that we wanted. And last week, um, John Tyson, our lead pastor, spoke about the need to turn away from distraction and make space to be attentive. He said the phrase that attention leads to adoration because attention is what's needed in order to encounter God and then to adore him. So today we're going to continue this conversation, this cycle, um, talking about what does it look like if we're attuned to God in prayer, then what would we be asking for and looking for in prayer? Where does the cycle of attention to adoration lead us over time if we continue to go through it? So today is actually going to be about longing, and next week, which I'm also preaching, is about the result of that longing. So you're lucky this won't be like Controversial Jesus, where it's an hour and a half, because I actually get two weeks to talk about one topic instead of doing it all in one night. Um, So today is about longing, and next week about what we're longing for, or another way to say it would be today is about revelation, and next week will be about glory. Over the course of these two Sundays, we're going to try to ask and answer five questions. The first is, when you pray, what do you want to be revealed? Second, when does God reveal himself? Third, how do I encourage this revelation of God? And then next week, we'll talk about what does God reveal and why do we need this type of revelation? But to begin, let's look at our teaching text. I know that Song of Songs is not the normal teaching text that you read out of, but I do encourage you to read it, even though it's basically rated R. So maybe not out loud at a family dinner. Um, Wait until your children are older and you've talked about puberty. Um, But it is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in all righteousness, so it's still important that we read it. So Song of Songs is not a common book. Um, But it is the story about two lovers who meet, fall in love, get engaged, and then get married. This book is also an allegory for God's relationship with his people and therefore gives us a great starting point for talking about the relationship between attention and revelation because they're actually two sides of a story. So let me give you an example of something that might not be true of current dating culture, but even if you were to look maybe 20, 30 years ago, would be true of how a couple meets. So first, a man needs to notice a woman, right? That's that's the beginning. They, They don't date, they don't get married unless the man notices the woman in the room, and he pays attention to her. And maybe by paying attention, he becomes aware of her and what she's like, and he begins to appreciate her. Now, if he begins to feel feelings of admiration, then he might pursue that woman in some way, asking for her name or asking her to go on a date. And if the woman has also stopped and paid attention to that man and decided she might be interested in him, then she might allow that pursuit. And if she's not interested and the man continues to pursue her, that's called stalking. (laughs) But in an ideal world, we don't go down that road, and instead we go down the road in which the man's interested, he asks her on a date, maybe she's interested, and she says yes. So in the midst of this pursuit of this asking on a date, the man and woman might begin to or choose to reveal parts of themselves, like their names, their families, their um, family backgrounds, their interests, their hobbies. They ask questions of each other. And the man should not force these revelations or the woman force those revelations. It should be something that's invited, right? Invited through questions and listening and paying attention and pursuit. And so over time, the man and the woman might begin to reveal little things about themselves. And in a healthy relationship, the two would continue to pursue and pay attention and reveal themselves to each other. In an unhealthy relationship, one party stops paying attention. And so then the revelations die out. 
right? Because no one wants to continue to share their heart with someone who doesn't remember, isn't paying attention, and forgets easily. But if the parties are both interested in each other, and they continue to pursue each other and admire each other and share more about each other, then over the time, the two might choose to commit to each other in a marriage covenant. And in the context of covenant is where the real revelation, the big ones, are going to happen. Because, of course, on the marriage night is when they reveal their entire bodies, complete nakedness before each other. But then that's just actually the beginning, right? As, as anyone knows that if you continue to pursue each other in marriage, you then find out all the other things about each other, like your faults, your weaknesses, your struggles, your habits, your jokes. It's an ongoing revelation. And if that couple continues to pay attention and to pursue one another, then this revelation becomes daily and ongoing and for their whole life. It's only in the context of a lifelong pursuing covenant that the full beauty of each other comes out, the wisdom, the depth of that other person, their glory. So it's sustained attention, invites revelation, which leads to glory. But of course, to our modern ears, this all sounds like an idealized world compared to our current dating culture. Who in our city would really be able to say the words of Song of Songs for, I will get up now and go about the city. Through its streets and squares, I will search for the one my heart loves. And when I find the one my heart loves, I held him and I would not let him go. Instead, our city says, I will search the city from the comfort of my phone until I find someone willing to have a one-night stand. In place of slow courtship, which understands that revelation and intimacy are something that is earned over time, our culture asks for naked pictures and sex on the first date. There's no long attention focused on one person. And it's funny because even as we acquiesce and maybe give our bodies to another person, I think most of us know deep inside that we're holding something back. As I was preparing for today, it reminded me of the scene in Pretty Woman, which is, yes, now an old film. Um, But Julia Roberts is playing a prostitute, but she, so she's giving her body constantly, but she talks about the one thing she withholds, which is kissing a man. She says, that's the thing I hold back until I love someone. So even as we give our bodies quickly to other people in our culture, we know that that's actually not revealing our whole self. We're actually giving a false self out. Our society wants all the benefits of intimacy, i.e. revelation, without any of the energy, patience, or pursuit that is required for real revelation. Sadly, the same can often be said of our views of God as a culture. Our culture says things like, if God is really real, why doesn't he just show himself to me right now? It's like asking God for a revelation or a naked picture when we haven't even gotten to know his character. Or maybe we say things like, if there's a God out there, why doesn't he answer my prayers and give me what I want? It's like wanting the benefits of a lover without any of the covenant commitment. I just want someone to make me a meal, buy me flowers, but I don't actually want to know them. God is actually... (laughs) I'm glad this analogy is working for us. The sad thing about all this is God is actually very generous. He's very generous to us every day. We're told that he gives rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. And yet, as a culture, we demand even more without having done anything to get to know him. The truth is that revelation comes in the context of covenant. We need to commit. We need to pay attention. And in that place, then we get to know revelation. Now, for those of us that know Jesus, we've entered into a covenant in his blood. We, too, can be shallow in our requests of God, missing the potential for intimacy in our relationships with God. Which brings us to our first question, which is really a diagnostic. When you pray, what are you primarily asking for? Or, when you pray, what do we want to be revealed? Do we want God to show us what to do? To answer our questions, to give us what we want or what we need, 
for God to reveal the future or wisdom or provision or sin in our hearts or to forgive us or show us our need for him. Now, if you're just entering into a relationship with God, it's okay to pray whatever you've got. That's what John said two weeks ago. You just pray what you've got. Or if you're in a period of life right now where you are just decimated and the most you can get out is, God, that's okay. This sermon is actually about what we're supposed to do over the course of our life. Because if our prayers are always just, God, show me what to do. God, give me the answer to this question. God, reveal the future. Then really, we want the gifts more than the giver. We want a revelation of what he's going to do for us more than we want to know him. And we know that that's actually not healthy in relationships. You would never build a long-lasting marriage by just always asking the person for what you need and never paying attention to who they are. As Tozer wrote, the evil habit of seeking God and effectively prevents us from finding God in full revelation. In the and lies our great woe. If we omit the and, we shall soon find God. And in him, we shall find that for which we have all our lives been secretly longing. Passionate prayer pursues the heart of God, longing for a revelation of God himself, not of his gifts. Because this is a two-way relationship. God pursues us so we can pursue him. God loves us and longs for us to love him in return. We should not just pray for the things that we want. We should pray to encounter God. So, following in line with John, each week we have a phrase. So, turn to your neighbor and say, passionate prayer pursues. I've even made an alliteration for you. Good. Now say it to your other neighbor. Okay, good. So we're supposed to pray what we've got, attention leads to adoration, and passionate prayer pursues. It pursues the heart of God, not just the gifts, but the giver himself. It wants revelation. So when does God reveal himself? Our second question. Well, there's sort of two parts to this um, that the scriptures tell us. The first is that we learn that God is ever-present, that we can actually see him at any point in time, that every day there's an opportunity to know God better. He daily reveals himself. And he does that through nature, through other humans, through the scriptures. We're told that heaven and earth declare the glory of God. Psalm 19 reads, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. So created world is always showing us glimpses of who God is like. His character, his might, his power, his gentleness. And this is why Paul says to the Athenians in Acts 17, God did this so that we would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So we have all these glimpses of who God is. And God is actually always present. We're just not aware of his presence. But these other things that we can see that reveal who he is draw us closer to him. So God is not a distant watchmaker. He's not somewhere up there and you're hoping that you can talk to him. He's ever present, ever accessible to us. We just have to notice he's there, which is the second way that God reveals himself. A.W. Tozer calls it the manifest presence of God. And this happens when we become aware of God. So, for example, you could be in a large room of people, and someone else is present in that room, right? They're there. You could go and talk to them, but until you notice them and go talk to them, they're not really present for you. And that's the same thing that the scriptures are saying, is that God is everywhere at all times. He's always present, but we have to notice that he's there. We have to notice and turn towards him. And so... How do we actually move towards God? The first thing is that we have to learn to turn aside. We have to pause in his presence. John referenced this in passing last week. A great example of this is Jacob in Genesis 27. Jacob has left his family. He's traveling through the wilderness. And he goes to sleep and he has a dream of angels going up and down a ladder into heaven. And when he wakes up, he calls the place Bethel or the house of God. And he says these words, surely the Lord was in this place and I was not aware. So God was always there. Jacob just realizes, oh, 
you're actually here. He's now present to God. And so he puts a pile of stones up so he'll always remember that here is where I noticed God. Or a perfect example of this is in Exodus. Moses is walking through the wilderness and he sees a bush on fire. Now he could have just seen it and been like, oh, that's odd, and then kept walking. Or, oh, this must not be any rain this season. But instead he turns aside and he notices it. And it's when he approaches the bush that he now hears the voice coming out of the bush. Right? He now hears God's voice. But he doesn't just say, oh, there's a bush that's talking, and then walk on. He listens and he removes his shoes and he realizes he's in holy ground. So he has to turn aside and discover that God is actually there in that moment already, but he has to respond to it. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, at the end of her, one of her poems, says, Earth crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. See, the, adoration, the attention adoration circle begins by choosing to pay attention. And then it becomes this unending circle as we go deeper and deeper into attention, greater attention and adoration. As we learn to keep turning aside, to keep noticing that God is present, to realize that in every every opportunity in life, every moment, every place that we step, we can actually have an encounter with God because God is already there. We have to know that he's not far from us. So this leads us to our third question. How do we encourage God to reveal himself? Because, of course, only God can reveal himself. Just like in that dating analogy, only the other party can choose to tell you more of who they are. We can't force it out of them. And God in the scriptures says that it's the spirit who reveals the son. The son reveals the father. The father gives prophecies about who the son is. We can't actually know God without him revealing himself. So how do we learn to turn aside over and over again and encourage this revelation from God? And that's by learning to not be satisfied in the beginning. So just like a lover who continues to ask questions, you never go on a first date with someone you like and then just never talk to them again. Well, sometimes that does happen. But in theory, you shouldn't do that, right? Because you're not satisfied. You go on the first date and you're like, that was amazing. Or in the case of me and my husband, I think we talk like 40 hours a week in the beginning of our dating. It was like, you couldn't get enough. It was like, we have to just keep talking. The day ends, we're going to keep texting. Right? Because you're not satisfied with that little bit. You want to know more. Because passionate prayer pursues the heart of God. And the heart of God is unending and unfathomable. And you can never get to the end of it. There's, you could keep asking questions. You could keep going on dates with God for all of eternity. Which is basically what we're going to do. And it will never end. There's always more to learn. There's always more to discover. And so we need to learn to not be satisfied with our small encounters with him. Just like, oh, great, I saw a burning bush today. That's awesome, check. But that's what we do. We think, oh, well, a year ago I had this amazing encounter with God. But we need to learn to not be satisfied. And we see that in the scriptures. David is a great example of this. He's called a man after God's own heart because he chases after the heart of God. He's not satisfied. In Psalm 42, he writes, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? He was, he was just living right, right down the street from where the temple was going to be built. He's right there, but he's like, this is not enough. I need more of you, God. And in Psalm 27, he says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this one do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. He's thirsting, he's hungering, he's not satisfied with the last encounter with God. He wants another one. The sons of Korah, who were a group of priests who ministered in the temple every single day, wrote this. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. It's like they spend all day in the temple. They go home and they're like, oh, no, it'd be better to be in the temple again. They're like, they don't want to leave. They always want to be in God's presence. Or another example, every year the Israelites would travel to Jerusalem three times a year and they would sing these phrases as part of the Psalms of Ascent. Psalm 130 says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. They can't wait to be in God's presence. 
They're longing for him. They're not satisfied with a couple months ago when they were in Jerusalem. They want it again. And if you haven't noticed, everything I've quoted so far is poetry. And that's because this is about passion and about pursuit. It's about panting and thirsting and yearning and seeking and fainting and crying out and waiting with anticipation for God to show up. And if you're thinking, well, I'm not really the poetic type. I just want you to remember maybe the first time that you were in love. Even if you are a T on their Myers-Briggs, as far as you can, (laughs) cynically. When you fall in love, it's like, whoa! I'm in love, right? Like, you just want to sing. You just want to tell everybody that. You just want to write poetry. You're, like, texting the person. You're like, oh, I hope this is, good. this is what's in my heart, right? Like, that's what they're trying to tell us here. They're saying that, oh, being in God's presence is like poetry. You can't write this as law code. You can't write it like a story that just tells you what happens. It only comes out in poetry. It's a longing for God's presence, Because all these people understood that one encounter with God was not enough. As miraculous as redemption is, as wondrous as that moment of salvation, that moment of conversion, new birth in the spirit is just the beginning. We were never meant to find Jesus, get saved, and then be distant from God for the rest of our life. That's not how the story goes. God created us for intimacy in the context of covenant that gets deeper and deeper and deeper with time. Or as C.S. Lewis explains at the end of the Chronicles of Narnia, we go farther up and further in, farther up and further in, and that's what we're going to do for all of eternity. Who God is is like an ocean whose depths we can never reach the bottom of. It's like the expanse that we could never swim across. You and I were not designed to enter into a relationship with him and then be far from him, to have one encounter or to have one encounter a year. No, we were meant to daily sit in his presence and bask in his goodness. And we see this truth in God's instructions to Israel. God did not merely appear to the Israelites once on Mount Sinai. No, he lives with them in the tabernacle and in the temple in a pillar of cloud and fire. He wants to keep traveling with them. He doesn't say, oh, it's good enough that you just saw me once. He's always in their midst. And then when they get to Israel, he says that everybody in the whole land has to travel to Jerusalem three times a year. They have to keep coming back into his presence their entire lifetime. And this physical journey into God's presence is meant to represent the journey that he wants them to take each day into his presence. This journey is long, but it's full of praises. All the 15 Psalms of Ascent talk about the anticipation of arriving in Jerusalem and being in God's presence. They were meant to mimic the interior journey of drawing close to God. God was teaching his people to always be in his presence. But sadly, we can relate to this. The Israelites actually don't really respond to God's longing for intimacy. Instead, they pull away. At Mount Sinai, we forget this part of the story, but at first, all the people are invited to go up onto the mountain. So God appears in an earthquake and in fire and in lightning, and then he wants all of them to come up into the mountain. But they're afraid. And so they hold back and they say, no, 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 Moses, you go as our representative. You go up the mountain. And so it's only the elders that go up and see God's feet. And it's only Moses that gets to see God's glory and hear his voice. Everybody else misses out. These people miss out on seeing a full revelation of God, and they trade their opportunity to be God's priests. So instead, God appoints the Levites to be the priests, and then all future generations, it's just the Levites who enter into God's presence. And, and they don't even fully. There's all these curtains that separate the temple. And only the high priest goes in once a year into the presence of God. They could have all known and experienced and seen God, but instead, they choose to stay at a distance. They choose to live in the courts. The same thing happens when Jesus appears. Jesus is God's glory in human flesh. And he's not satisfied to merely pop to earth, die on the cross, and then leave again. Right? He could have Maybe he could have done that. 
But no, instead, Jesus lives among the people for many years that we have no recorded information about. He just lives with the people. He eats with them. He teaches them. Because he wasn't satisfied with one encounter with humanity. He wanted them to know him as rabbi, as shepherd, and as bridegroom. And yet, at the time of Jesus, people still pulled away from intimacy with God. Instead of becoming a disciple, they returned home to their families, to their wealth, to their jobs. And when, at Jesus' death, the curtain of the temple, the Holy of Holies, separating God's presence from the people, when that gets ripped from top to bottom, created that way so that people could rush into God's presence, what do they do? They sew it back up again. Let's not make the same mistake. Having received Jesus' sacrifice for sin, let's not remain on the outside of God's temple. Let's not sit in the outer courts, just right where the sacrifice happened. Let's run into the inner sanctuary. This is why Hebrews 10.22 says, Since we have a high priest Jesus and our hearts are sprinkled with his blood, let's draw near to God. We're not supposed to stop at the moment of redemption. That just gets us in. And then we're supposed to run into his presence and get to know him more and more. We should not be satisfied to live on the edges of God's presence, only encountering him every once in a while. So we need to turn away from being fearful. Yes, it's overwhelming to encounter a holy God. But others have in the past, and he wants us to. And we need to not become complacent and distracted by lesser things. God wants all of us, and he wants to give us all of him. Now, maybe you're here tonight and you think, well, that's just for some people. Like Elijah or Moses or David. God wanted all of the Israelites to go up that mountain. He calls you a holy priesthood. You're a nation that he picked out. He loves you and he wants you to know him. It's for you. You can completely, you can completely enter in confidently into God's presence. And so let us run into the inner sanctuary and live there in the Holy of Holies. David does that. He lives under the ark. We need to not be satisfied with one encounter. And if we aren't satisfied, this is going to lead us into a lifelong pursuit of God. And this, there's a couple reasons that this is good news. The first is that God loves being pursued. All the great men and women of faith in the Bible were pursuers. Enoch walked with God and then was no more. Abraham was a friend of God. David was a man after God's own heart. Moses spoke to God face to face. Joshua remained behind in the tent. And Anna never left the temple. They understood that the, the promise of Psalm, of Psalm 14, the Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. God's eyes are searching for you. They're searching for those who are seeking him. He loves being pursued. Secondly, the scriptures tell us that it's our joy, our honor, our glory to pursue God. Proverbs 25, 2 reads, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search it out. So God doesn't show all of himself immediately. He, he hides some of it back so we can search for him. Because that's actually what brings us joy when we read the scriptures again. We're like, oh, I never knew that before. When God speaks to him, like, oh, he spoke to me again. Oh, he's changed me. It's our joy. We were created to go on a treasure hunt to figure out who God is. This is what Matthew 13 says. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. Or again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. Jesus is the treasure buried in the field. He is the pearl of great price. He is worth searching out. And when we find him, we're filled with joy. It's our glory to search out who God is. Tozer says, to have found God and still to pursue him is the soul's paradox of love, scorned indeed by the too easily satisfied religionist, 
but justified in happy experience by the children of the burning fire. Read that part again. To have found God and still to pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. It's that we aren't satisfied. That's a good thing. We get to discover more. And I love this phrase at the end, the children of the burning fire, that we're tending to the flame of love in our own heart because we're standing outside of that pillar of fire and we're saying, we want more. We want to always be in your presence, God. We don't ever want to leave your courts. I also love it because it sounds a little bit like a fantasy series, but we're the children of the burning fire. We stand there and we pursue him. Next, the scriptures say that there's always more to know and explore about God. That's part of the joy. That's part of the paradox is that we can keep discovering more of who he is. Moses is a great example of a man who pursues God throughout his lifetime, always asking for more of God. First, he turns aside and he sees the burning bush. And that, that's pretty amazing, right? I think most of us would be like, I saw a bush on fire that wasn't consumed and God's voice came out of it. Like, we'd be like, great, I'm happy. Like, that's it. But Moses is like, no, I want more. So then he sees God's miraculous hand at work in Egypt and he hears his voice. But then he sees the splitting of the Red Sea. That's pretty epic, guys. I'd be like, whoa. But he's like, that, that's still not enough. Then he sees God on Mount Sinai. He's like, I'm going into the, up the mountain, guys. I'm going into the cloud and the earthquake. I want to hear God's voice. But then even after all of that, after going up the mountain and hearing God's voice and receiving the, ten, the laws and the Ten Commandments and seeing God's feet, he still has the chutzpah to say, God, show me your glory. Like, I haven't seen it all. I want more of this, Lord. And God is so pleased by that. Tozer expresses it this way. Moses used the fact that he knew God as an argument for knowing him better. He's like, God, you've shown me some. I want more. Like, I need more. I'm not happy with just your feet. I want your glory. Moses hungers so much for God that we're told in Numbers 12 that how God interacts with him is different than any other prophet. God says that to other prophets, he reveals himself in visions. Now, if you or I woke up with a vision from God, we'd be like, oh, wow, that's amazing. But God's like, no, that's just the beginning. Because to Moses, I speak mouth to mouth. I speak directly and openly like I would speak to a friend. And on top of that, in the Hebrew, it says that Moses beholds the form of the Lord. So long before God comes in the form of a baby and lives among us in Jesus, Moses somehow has a Christophany. He has a theophany. He sees God's form because he hungers so much after him. God gives him secrets into things that many generations wouldn't see till years later because he wants it. He's not satisfied. There's always more to know and explore about God. And finally, God promises us, promises us that each time we pursue him, we will find him. Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Or Proverbs 8, I love those who love me and those who seek me will find me. When we are not satisfied, when we pursue the heart of God, we will find him. He will reveal himself to us. So with Moses' story in mind, Let's return to that opening analogy of lovers. Relationship begins with paying attention, with turning aside, with noticing. And then it grows in intimacy. It's a pursuing of the other person and a hope that they'll reciprocate. And then as love and intimacy grows, then it may turn into a lifelong pursuit of one another in the context of a marriage covenant. The marriage ceremony is not an end to the pursuit, but it's the beginning and with pursuit comes greater revelation and greater intimacy. Marriage, even idealized marriage described in the Song of Songs, is but a small taste of what our pursuit of God is designed to look like. You and I were designed and created for an unending, ever-expanding intimacy with the God of the universe. We were created to be pursued by God and to pursue him in return. And it's only in pursuing God that we will see him getting ever-growing revelations of who he is. So for this first part of our two-part series, what is our application for this week? 
Maybe you've come here today and you're like, I don't even know if I've ever experienced the manifest presence of God. I don't know if I've ever heard him. Or for some of you here, you might think, yes, I have before, but I want more. How do I cultivate a hunger for God's presence? Well, Tozer says that faith is the gaze of the soul upon a saving God. It's about beholding God. So I have three action steps for us this week to try out. The first is I want to encourage you to create moments of time throughout your week to sit and behold God. The scriptures say, be still and know that I am God. So create some moments. Maybe there's worship music playing. Maybe you're in a comfortable chair. But sit and just say, God, I want to behold you. Now, it's okay if this first time your mind gets distracted. We're learning, right? We're practicing. No one's excellent at piano the first time they sit down at the piano. Trust me, I've been at too many children's concerts. That's okay. We're doing this for all of eternity, people. We're just building muscles right now. So sit and say, Lord, I want to behold you. I want to know you. I want to reflect upon your beauty and your goodness and your holiness and your wisdom. And as you do that throughout this week, ask God to increase your hunger. Maybe that's the mantra of your week. is like, Lord, give me a greater hunger for you. Give me a greater thirst for you. Because God actually does do that. The spirit is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He cries out, Abba, Father. He translates our inner groaning. So we can ask the spirit to give us more hunger for him. And third... Just practice turning aside, just throughout your day. This, may, this isn't a planned thing, right? The sitting in God's presence, that's a planned thing. But the turning aside is just like, as you walk through your day, go, oh, wow, that's a beautiful flower. Lord, thanks for making that flower. I love the delicate nature of it. Or, oh, Lord, thank you for this moment. Or, wow, Lord, look at what you did in creating that person. Just learn to turn aside. Because the thing is, is that God is always present. And as you turn aside, he'll speak to you. So as you open the scriptures, he'll speak to you. Sometimes we sort of treat the scriptures like a checklist, right? So we, we almost teach it, treat it like that burning bush. We're like, okay, I've read my 10 verses. Great. 10 verses, check. And he's like, wait, I want to talk to you. So just, just turn aside. <laughs> right? We're like, great, there's a bush on fire. Right? He, he wants to talk to you. So it's just turning aside, pausing, and listening. So that's what we're going to practice this week. Next week, we're going to try to answer our final two questions, which is, when God does reveal himself, what does he reveal? The short answer is the Bible describes God's full revelation of himself as his glory. This is why Moses cries out, show me your glory. He's like, I don't want these small revelations. I want the full thing. I want you to show up, God. Because he knows that these other revelations are just a taste of God. They're just a dim reflection in a mirror. He wants the real thing. So come back next week and we're going to talk about what glory is. And then our second question is, why do we need a revelation of God's glory? So I know I've kind of done this backwards. I want you to practice thirsting for for him before you know totally why you're doing it and hungering for him and wanting a revelation before you know how he's going to show up. But that's okay. He'll show himself to you. But we need to learn to ask God to reveal himself. And then he shows us his glory, and we actually need his glory. But in preparation for next week, I've been thinking a lot about the book of Job, in part because of things that have been happening in our community. So I just wanted to share this with you as something to chew on this week. Um, In the book of Job, we get a profound insight into a chapter or a sliver of Job's life when he loses everything. His property, his livestock, his servants, even his children. And like all of us, the cry of Job's heart is, why, Lord, why? And at first, three of his friends try to answer Job's questions, mostly by saying that if, God, if Job were truly righteous, God would not have let these things happen. So it must be Job's fault. He sins somewhere. Job's response to his friends is to waver between justifying his behavior believing that God hears him, and asking God yet again to answer his why question. Finally, we get a fourth friend who comes on the scene, and he doesn't blame Job for the catastrophe, but he also reminds Job to humble himself before God because only God is truly righteous. Now, it's at this point, 38 chapters in, that God finally shows up. 
Now, like Job, we might expect God to arrive and answer all of Job's questions, or maybe give him insight into the conversation that's happened in heaven that we all see as readers. Or maybe tell Job how Job is going to be an example to future generations when they're suffering. Or maybe God will show up and raise his children from the dead. But God does none of these things. Instead of revealing the mysteries of the universe, God reveals himself to Job. He appears to Job in all of his glory, his might, his power, his wisdom. And in response to that revelation of God, Job worships. Even though Job didn't know it, what Job needed more than anything, the only thing that would actually meet him in his pain, in his anger, in his confusion, was a revelation of God. Passionate prayer is about pursuing the heart of God because only a revelation of God in all his glory will satisfy the deep longings of the human heart. So, this week... Let's practice pursuing. Let's practice longing. Let's practice thirsting. Believing that God wants to show himself to us. And that actually when he shows himself to us, that will be the thing that we need more than anything else. More than the gifts, we need the giver. More than the acts of service, we need the lover of our souls. Let's pray.